I'm feeling a little woozy. I'm seeing double. Um, <laughs> wow, that was a blessing. Uh, God has gifted us with gifted people. Thanks, guys. I think the Lord was glorified in that. The psalmist talks about praising Him on the timbrel and the harp and all kinds of instruments, and we just witnessed that. And was illustrated before us the very fact that uh, many hands make light work. Okay? Uh, good, good, good illustration. Well, hey, uh, let's go before the Lord, the Ancient of Days in prayer, and uh, let's um, appreciate our smallness in the light of His greatness. Heavenly Father, it's a, a joy to know You, and it's a privilege to approach You. We know we cannot come by ourselves. Our sin is ever before us. We would say with Peter, depart from me, I am a sinful man. Um, our sin clings to us like the skin, and our body clings to the bone. Lord, we um, have fallen short of your glory. We deserve your wrath. And yet we marvel this morning that we know you as our Father. We can come to you unafraid because of your Son, Jesus Christ. If any man sins, uh, he has an advocate with the Father, uh, Jesus the righteous. We thank you for his righteousness. We thank you for his willingness to die the just, for the unjust to take our place, to build a bridge uh, between the gaping uh, chasm, uh, between uh, us and God, heaven and earth. We thank you that He has gifted us His righteousness and covered us with His righteousness so that our nakedness and ugliness cannot be seen. Lord, I pray there will be no one here this morning who, uh, who, who is seeking to dress themselves in the filthy rags of their own self-righteousness, that they would understand it's by grace we're saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Lord, thank you as we have ended this presidential week that we can turn to the ancient of days. We can turn to a throne that is from of old, a throne that has been established forever. Kings will rise and kings will fall. Presidents will come and presidents will go. They may last four or eight years, but you abide forever. And we thank you for that reality, and we cling to it, and we find our, our calm there where we still ourselves and know that you are God, that um, the sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without your observation, and nations don't rise and fall without your permission. And so we thank you for that. We'll see this morning this glorious vision in Isaiah 6 of a God who sits upon a throne high and lifted up. Lord, uh, things in life can bring us down, but nothing will ever bring you down. And in that, we find refuge and strength and help in a time of trouble. Lord, we have had our chance this week. We thank you for the ability to uh, vote but we have had our chance at shaping history, but we know that you alone finally shape history. And we would pray in the words of your Son, as He taught us to pray, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We recognize, however this uh, thing falls out, that the powers that be are ordained of God. And uh, we pray that soon we'll come to a, a, a resolution on this, that, um, that indeed there'll be a certification of the election and a clear winner emerge, and we pray that indeed we would recognize as your people uh, that indeed um, that person is there by your permission and that you are sovereign over all that's happening before us and, our, and around us. Lord, we uh, thank you for the joy of serving you, and uh, we pray that we would um, be about our Father's business, uh, that we would indeed seek to build one another up, reach the lost for, for Christ, 
and uh, be a salt and light in the world. We thank you for uh, this church. We thank you for our people. We pray that today and across the week, that whatever we do, we'll do it to the glory of God, whether it's eating or evangelizing. Lord, we uh, thank you for our partnerships with missionaries across the world. We think of the blurs in Central Europe this morning. Thank you for Larry and Dawn. We know that where they are is a challenge, but may they um, always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that their labor is not in vain, that, that you are building your church in the gates of hell that will not prevail. Lord, we, uh, we celebrate uh, with, with uh, Ken and Walia the, the birth of little Arabella this week. We thank you for this little one, her life formed wonderfully in her mother's womb. Um, we, we pray that um, it would please you to preserve this little one's life and give her the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray for her parents, that they would be prayerful, that they would take the task of, of bringing this little one up in the fear and admonition of the Lord seriously. We, we believe that of them and for them. We, we know that there are many others in our, our church who are pregnant and, and moving towards delivery in the early stages of pregnancy. Just watch over that process. We, 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 we marvel at the gift of life, and the, we marvel at your artistry in putting uh, a life together made in your image, uh, male and female. Uh, we, we pray that indeed that as a church we would always consider that sacred and that we would indeed fight for the unborn and those who can't fight for themselves. Lord, we thank you for this set of songs. It's, it's a cheery and, and, and happy thing to uh, be in the presence of God we, we pray that indeed that you might be large uh, that, and we might be small, uh, and, and that in the light of your greatness, even the greatest of men um, are brought down to size and everything is put into perspective. So, for the time that remains together, help us to focus on the Word, help us to push distractions away, help us in the midst of our context to, to, to realize that, that what you're about to say to us will shape and color or should all that we face in a given week. And these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're delighted you're here in second service, either in the auditorium or out on the campus. There are those that are joining us online, both here in the United States and further afield. And so it's a joy uh, to be among God's people this morning. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house uh, of the Lord. Just a couple of things, uh, not to repeat um, all that uh, Charles uh, so eloquently communicated. Uh, but ladies, do remember the women's Christmas events coming up. As you heard, that event now has been pushed into wider media platforms, and we want you to enjoy Ruth uh, Chai Simons. So uh, sign up today. It's a Thursday night and a Friday night, December the 3rd and 4th. It's an evangelistic outreach, so think about someone you can bring to a very inviting uh, environment, uh, something they will enjoy, but hopefully will make a mark on them for the gospel. So, uh, you can sign up. Uh, all our tents are over at the back of the large tent, so go there today. Uh, if not, go on to the church website, kindredchurch.org slash KWM Christmas and sign up for that. As you heard too, next Sunday morning, our Sunday lunchtime, we're going to open our new offices. Um, for those that are uninitiated, and not far from here, up in the business area, just left of where the Target and the Anaheim Festivals area is, we've got um, some 20,000 square feet of office space, a new ministry uh, um, space, which we're really excited about. Thank you for your generosity in 2000. And 20. That's allowed us to pay that all off, and we want you to see it. We've got new music room for our choir. We've got some new offices for our staff. Uh, we've got uh, new leadership uh, classrooms, and we've got a biblical counseling center. It's beautiful. I think you'll like it, and uh, we would love you to come and see it. It'll be open between 12.15 and 12.2.15. We'll get you some uh, directions in the bulletin for next week. It's up in Chaparral Court. 
but you'll want to come and see it. Well, maybe we'll pray and dedicate it to the Lord. It just expands our footprint in this area. It's yours. You'll be in it. Uh, we have also, some of you have seen, but part of that will be let you see the new youth center that's being used um, very, very much in the last lot of months. But some of you haven't seen that. It's all tied together, and God is good. And we're thankful for your faithfulness. And uh, God willing, as we move into 2020, uh, our leadership is focused on, on uh, revisiting our master plan for this, this facility and uh, this campus. And we'll bring you up to speed on that. One other thing, guys, men's breakfast this Saturday in person. We're going to provide a breakfast for you. It's the normal time. We'll have breakfast somewhere starting at 7, but it goes through to about quarter to 8, close to 8 o'clock. And it's a catered breakfast. And uh, we'd love you to be here. We'll probably still provide an online experience if you can't make it or don't want to come in person. Uh, but um, breakfast Saturday, we're back into our series, Take the Call. And I'm going to look at the subject of suffering. There's a verse in First Peter that says we are called to suffer like and for Him. Um, I want to remind you, no one said it would be easy. If you thought the Christian life was easy, uh, someone was lying to you. Um, or you're reading the wrong kind of books, maybe listening too much to a guy with a great smile. But, but, but that, that's not the issue. The issue is we're going to remind ourselves uh, that it's, it's not easy. Uh, we're called to suffer and pay a price for our loyalty to Jesus Christ. So see you on Saturday, guys, in-person catered breakfast. Well, those are all the announcements. Make them subject to God's will. I want to invite you to take your Bible and uh, turn to Isaiah 6. Now, you know, uh, I was on vacation um, a, a week ago, and, um, you know, we, we uh, started the book of Acts, and we got uh, kind of into that a little bit, and I should be in back into that this morning, but um, I've decided, given all that's, that's transpired, uh, that indeed we would turn to Isaiah chapter 6, and um, I've been kind of uh, pouring uh, into this passage this week. I, I needed it, and, and you needed it. Uh, I've been helped by many commentators. By the way, uh, one of the, the books I consulted was, was uh, the four volumes written by uh, Dr. Jim Rosscup, uh, who many of you know, who, who actually passed away this week, uh, went to be with the Lord, entered into his, his reward, and we'll be honoring him soon enough here uh, at, at the church um, but um, he certainly helped me. Others helped me uh, come to view the, the glory of this passage and its importance, um, given just where our country's at uh, and, and how people may be feeling as regards the outcome of the election. I want to regain our focus. That's what I've called the message, regaining focus. And uh, I want you to keep your Bible open at Isaiah 6, uh, verses 1 through um, 8. You know, the night that uh, Abraham Lincoln was, was assassinated, a crowd of 50,000 people gathered at the front of the uh, exchange building in New York City. As you can imagine, uh, emotions were high. The news was filtering out of the great president's uh, death, and there was a fear that this crowd of 50,000 people could become a destructive mob. And into that context, a man steps, well-dressed, uh, uh, in a military uh, uniform, and he, he uh, addresses the crowd from the balcony of the exchange building, and he says this with a very clear uh, uh, and commanding voice, fellow citizens, clouds and darkness are round about him. His pavilion is dark waters and thick clouds of the skies Justice and judgment are the establishment of His throne. Mercy and truth go before His face. Fellow citizens, God reigns, and the government in Washington still stands. The man who said that was actually James Garfield, who would have become the president of the United States himself. But what a, what a calming word. God reigns, and the government in Washington still stands. And I want to use that as an introduction this morning to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, because you and I need to remind ourselves, in the midst of change, in the midst of crisis, God reigns. 
You need to understand this morning by the eye of faith that heaven is fully operational, that God is carrying out His will, working all things together for good. It's a good thing to be reminded as a church, as a nation, as an individual, that in the midst of life's losses, we never lose anything of God. He abides faithful. His mercy endures. His Word stands forever. God is from everlasting to everlasting. His goodness and His mercy follow us all the days of our life. The only thing in life that will sustain us through dark days and clouded emotions is a luminous vision of our glorious God. I want to say that again. That's the proposition or the thesis of my sermon. I think it's the, 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 the teaching that comes out of Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 8. The only thing in life that will sustain us through dark days and clouded emotions is a luminous vision of a glorious God. I had an old pastor back in Northern Ireland who sadly died of a brain tumor, a godly man, a man of great humor and holiness, Ivan Thompson, and he used to say this to us at Rathkill Baptist Church, the outlook is often gloomy, but the uplook is always glorious. I like that. I've rememorized that. The outlook is often gloomy, but the uplook is always glorious. Can I tell you something I want you to think about? If you have a problem and that problem is overwhelming you, discouraging you, paralyzing you, tempting you to do things outside the will of God, I want to tell you, you have lost your vision of God. That's, that our problem when it comes to problems is we often lose sight of a vision of a glorious God. And I want to come to Isaiah 6 because at a challenging time in the life of the nation of Israel, the prophet of God was given a glorious vision of a wonderful God. So, take your Bible, keep it open at Isaiah 6 verses 1 to 8. There, there's four things here, the time, the throne, the terror, the task. Number one, the time. Look at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. That's the historical setting. That's the time we're told that when Isaiah encounters God in a fresh way, it was a time of national distress, a time of political upheaval, a time of the changing of the guard. And in the midst of that, and during that year of King Uzziah's demise and death, God met with Isaiah, and Isaiah met with God. From what we know, that's roughly 739 B.C. We know that King Uzziah... Uh, reigned for 52 uh, long, prosperous years. Uh, those were good years for the most part in the life of the nation. It says in, in the book of Chronicles that the King Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. God blessed his reign, and yet in the middle of all of that prosperity, arrogance took root in his heart. And, and while he started out well, and the nation was, was led well by him, and they saw military success, they saw economic prosperity, there was a sense of, of peace throughout the kingdom, yet, yet during that time, arrogance took root in his heart. And you can read in, in, in the Chronicles and the Kings about the fact that towards the end of his life, he, he tries to do the work of a priest. He goes barging into the temple, and he, and he does what God has forbidden kings to do. And God smites him with leprosy, and in 739, he dies. Started out well. The middle wasn't bad, but it wasn't a good finish. Well, I'm in my late 50s. I want to remember that. You may be off to a good start. You may be doing well in the middle, but how are you going to finish? It's been well said. Every boxer looks good in the first round. And you and I need to remind ourselves to run the race with 
endurance. We need to finish well. But, but sadly, Isaiah's demise kind of parallels the direction of the nation morally. By this stage, they are beginning to fall morally. In fact, in chapter 5, Isaiah will pronounce judgments and woes upon the nation. So, that's the time. That, that's the background. That, that's the setting of this drama. Now, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about that, pactorally and pastorally. This is the when of the vision, not the what. We're going to see the what of the vision soon enough, the throne and the terror and the task. But what about the time? Here's a thought or two. Write it down, mull over it. I would say this, given what I've just said, if I've understood this text correctly, bad times can be good times spiritually. In the year that King Uzziah died, and I've given you the background of that, I saw the Lord. I had a glorious encounter with God. I had a fresh encounter with God. And so, bad times can lead to good times spiritually if we, if we handle them correctly, if we throw ourselves upon God, if we, if we humble ourselves be, before Him. Bad times can drive us to the Lord. I mean, King Uzziah was Isaiah's friend. He, he ministered in his court, and at the death of his friend, and watching the, the things shift towards the end of his king, uh, at the end of his, his leadership and, and time as king, uh, Isaiah is disturbed, and, and, and his, the needs of the nation, and his own fears, and the questions that arise um, pushes him to go into the temple, and there in the temple, he encounters God. Our, our sense is he went into the temple, and while he was worshiping God in his earthly temple, um, that, that, that temple that was a symbol of a heavenly reality, we have the, the merging uh, of, of heaven and earth. We have God's glorious presence invading uh, the worship experience of Isaiah in a profound way. A bit like John in Revelation 1 verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I saw. And so, so here we have bad times uh, being good times spiritually because our needs and our questions and our fears and our despair properly handled drives us to God, whom we meet in the glorious sufficiency of who He is. And you'll notice that, that, that God took something away from Uzziah that He might give something to Isaiah. Um, God took away something so that Isaiah would fo focus fully on him, and, and God gave him a greater experience of himself. God took away Uzziah, which pressed Isaiah to fall upon God, and during that time he experiences God in a, in a profound and manifest way, and it reminds him of the one permanent relationship. It reminded him of the love that will not let him go, and it reminded him that God alone is worthy of our trust. Bad times can be good times spiritually, because in our weakness we see God's strength. In our confusion we meet God's wisdom. Having been abandoned or hurt by others, we are swallowed up in God's love. I've shared this before, Hudson Taylor. It does not matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies, whether it comes between you and God or whether it presses you nearer His heart. This pressure, the death of King Uzziah, this disappointment pressed Isaiah nearer to God's heart. Secondly, um, just by way of a practical and pastoral application, we see the necessity of worship. You know, Isaiah's concerns in the midst of the chaos is, is, is answered by worship. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. In, in the earthly temple, 
He is lifted in a unique vision to Him to the heavenly temple, and He is brought to see the grandeur of God and the grace of God and the greatness of God and the government of God, and that's good for Him. Isaiah doesn't sour. Isaiah doesn't become bitter. Isaiah seeks the Lord. Don't become sour. Seek the Lord. And those that seek Him will find Him or be found by Him, right? Jeremiah 29, 13 to 14. He doesn't look in. He doesn't look around. He looks up. You see, what Isaiah is doing here is he's, he's trying to center his life on the one who is at the center of life. When your center collapses, when, when your situation threatens to swallow you up, um, you, you need to center your life on the one who is the center of life. Uh, there is a throne at the center of the universe. There's not a big gaping hole at the center of the universe. There's not cold, dark fate at the center of the universe. There's a throne, and one who sits on it, who's grand and glorious and gracious. Uh, this, this is the challenge to you and me, the necessity of worship. You know, often we allow our hurt to drive us away from the Lord. We start reading our Bible. We're, 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 we're not as, 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 you know, faithful in our prayers. That's the last thing we should do, you know? That, that's, that's to spiritually cut yourself off at the knees. That's to shoot yourself in the foot. Psalm 73, the psalmist looks out, the, the wicked are, 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 are prospering, the, the world is not the way he wants it to be, nor is it the way it should be, and, and he's struggling, and he's, it pains him, and, and, and he, he, he's kind of in a, an emotional spiral, and we read in Psalm 73, verse 17, that, that this thing hurt me. It was too painful almost to consider. I, I kept stopped trying to think about it because when I thought about it, it was discouraging. And he says, it was painful until I went into the sanctuary and saw their end. I went in and worshiped God. I got a heavenly perspective. I spent some time around the throne at the center of the universe. And, and you know what? God's in charge. The wicked will perish. Righteousness will reign. In the end, we win. Or what about um, Revelation 4, 1 to 2? Uh, Revelation 2 and 3 is the letters of the Savior to the churches in Asia. And, and you know what? Because of the godlessness of the culture, the, the love of many at Ephesus is growing cold. There are some churches that, you know, are, are all shop window. They have a reputation, but they're inside. There's nothing. There's, there's immor immorality among the people of God. There's martyrdom taking place. And the church is, you know, facing um, the, 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 the sword of Domitian, the Roman Empire, emperor, and, and, and John is given a vision. And in Revelation 4, 1 to 2, he, he's called up uh, to heaven, and, and in, 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 the, in, in a vision, he, he sees heaven, and it says in Revelation 4, 1 and 2, and I saw a throne. And then he says this, and there was one who sat on it. And that one was the Lord Jesus. And you know what? You and I need to, to worship God. We need to, uh, you know, center our life on the fact that there's one who is at the center of life. I like what Robert Morgan says. Worship is the gyroscope of the soul. A person without pers personal patterns of worship is like a ship or an airplane without a stabilization or, or, or direction. When we worship, we are aligning our minds to God's truth, our imaginations to God's glory, our emotions to God's stability, and our souls to God's songs. When we worship, we are approaching a glorious throne, joining an eternal chorus, praising a triune God, and glorifying a worthy Lord. That's wonderful. Worship is the gyroscope of the soul. It's our magnetic north. It, it points us in the right direction. And that's what's happening here. We see the, the time. 
It's the year that King Uzziah died. The nation's in a tailspin. The future's foreboding. Assyria is, is, is mustering uh, troops to their north. Uh, everybody wonders uh, what's going to happen on the other side of this man's absence. And, and Isaiah goes with his worries to worship. And the good times become bad, or the bad times become good times spiritually, and, and, and worship becomes the gyroscope of his soul. Number two, the throne. The throne. We've already kind of alluded to this. I saw uh, the Lord sitting on a throne. Now, there's a wonderful contrast, right? You, you've probably got it, but let me just reinforce it. You've got this contrast. You've got a king in Uzziah who reigned for 52 years, whose glory has faded. He's dead. All right? The worms are having a feast. And another king who's on a throne, and he's been there from of old, and his throne is established forever. This is the deathless God. This is the eternal king. One throne is empty, and the other throne is occupied. Depends what you want to focus on, the Father's house or the White House. Human powers or divine sovereignty. So, so you have this, this wonderful uh, contrast that, that brings us during this time to consider a throne that's high and lifted up and a king whose, whose glory in, uh, uh, is like a robe that, that fills the, the, the temple. There, there's several things I want us to see here about uh, this throne or the vision that surrounds it, uh, about the one who uh, we encounter uh, here. Um, I want you to see that He is sovereign, He is separate, and He is served. God is sovereign, God is separate, God is served. Let's look at this first idea of God as sovereign. This throne is high and lifted up. That language is just reminding us this is a higher throne. This is the throne above all thrones. This is the king above all kings. If you read the rest of the prophecy of Isaiah, you're going to encounter a God uh, who, who, who weighs the nations in, a, in, in, in the balance of scales and they are but dust. You're going to encounter a God, according to Isaiah 46, verse 10, who knows the end from the beginning and the things not yet done, whose counsel will stand forever. So, in the midst of national upheaval and the political changing of the guard, God is shown to be ruling and overruling. Write down Psalm 45, verse 6, which, mean, which talks about God's throne established forever. And Psalm 93, verse 2, that God's throne is from old. You see, on a week like this, when, when, when at least half the country's hopes have been dashed, it's good to remind ourselves and each other that when it comes to the earth and its management, God is not an absentee Lord, landlord. He, he's working all things after the counsel of His own will. Ephesians 1 verse 11. He's not just a universal pressure. He's a universal, uh, sorry, presence. He's a universal pressure. It's not that just God is, is everywhere. God is everywhere working out His own counsel and will, managing, directing, ruling, and overruling through primary cause and secondary cause His kingdom purposes. The throne in Judah was empty. The throne in heaven was not. And we need just to remind ourselves of that. You, you've heard me quote these quotes many times, but I, I'm going to do it once more and many times after it. I love Corey Ten Boom's quote. There's no panic in heaven, only plans. That's, that's gold. There's no panic in heaven, only plans. In fact, God's sitting on His throne here. God's not piercing heaven, wringing His hand in anguish or, or anxiety. Or, or to quote uh, Adrian Rogers, the great Southern Baptist preacher, the Trinity never meets in emergency session. 
And here's what I want you to see about this throne and the God who sits on it, who's sovereign. Here's what I'd say to help you as, as, as we enter a new week. And I want you to think about this, and I want you to learn this lesson. Tragedy reminds us, disappointment reveals to us that we are not in charge. Okay? I hope you don't live under the illusion that you're in charge. If not, I've got a white jacket for you. (laughs) And there's a van waiting for you outside. (laughs) You, You and I only live in the illusion we're in charge. And maybe we get to manage life during good seasons. But usually when it comes to managing life, even that you get, that's only maybe Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And that's maybe only one afternoon of those days. And when things go belly up, when things change, it's a good reminder we're not in charge. And it raises the question, who's in charge? Is anybody in charge? Well, the answer is Isaiah 6. God's in charge. There's a throne that's high and lifted up. Um, Proverbs 16, verse 9, man makes his plans, but the Lord directs his steps. What about James 4? It's warning us. Hey, it's good to plan. It's good to think out. It's good to have dreams. Good to move in a direction. But, but hold on a minute now. Don't get too arrogant. You know, you might want to pencil your plans rather than write them in Sharpie permanent ink because you only get to do this if the Lord wills, right? What do you mean if the Lord wills? I thought I was in charge. No, dummy. He's in charge. He's in charge. Sometimes He blesses you and gives you a, a wide berth to pursue certain things under His providence, but, but, but un, be under no illusion. And, and tragedy and trouble and tears remind us of this. We are not in charge. Move over into the passenger seat. And better still, get into the back seat and let God lead the charge. And tragedy would remind us where true trust lies. Tragedy often betrays where our trust lies. We, 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 we implode when things go wrong because we have put our trust in our bank account and it gets emptied. We, we put our trust in our abilities and skills and, and, and they don't seem to work for us anymore, or the market has changed, or there's somebody better than you. We put our trust in personal relationships. We, we want human beings to meet our needs, political alliances. You get the point. You see, we've, we've all got our horses and chariots, bank accounts, human abilities, personal relationships, political answers, those are our horses and chariots that we think are going to come riding to our rescue. But what does the psalmist say in Psalm 20, verse 7? Some trust in horses and some in chariots. It's just an analogy that was a horse and a chariot spoke of strength and, and, and might. Just it's, Hey, some, some people put their trust in human might and political power and whatever. Some trust in horses and chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. And and this is what Isaiah is being brought to see. The bad times can be good times spiritually. And and if you'll you'll, you'll embrace the necessity to worship and, and gain a big vision of God, you'll come away understanding He's in charge. And by golly, that's a relief where you can go to bed at night knowing it's not all depending on you. And someone is working all things together for good. And it's a challenge to say, where is your trust? Is it in politicians? It is in people? Is it in positions? Is it in a certain place? God's ultimately in charge. Whatever brings us down never brings Him down. He remains lofty, high, lifted up, on a throne that's exalted. Hey, talking about the election, I was both interested and ministered to by an article I came across uh, last night on, on my Fox News feed. It was an article written late last night by Pastor Robert Jeffress. 
First Baptist Dallas. In fact, uh, he's been at the heart uh, of, of much of what's unfolded in the last uh, four years. It, you might want to read this little article. It's called, Biden is President-Elect. How should Christians respond? What is God doing in this outcome? Why would He allow this to happen? It's a great article. gives you some things to think about, but I'm going to steal a story out of it that applies to the point I'm just, just making Robert Jeffress, who, who I've actually had some time with myself and enjoyed lunch with, he's a, he's a good man. He says this, in, in January 2016, a year before Donald Trump was inaugurated as president, I was flying around Iowa with the then businessman to campaign with him before the Iowa caucuses. We had just finished our elegant lunch at Wendy's Cheeseburgers. When I said to him, quote, Mr. President or Mr. Trump, I believe you're going to be the next president of the United States. And if that happens, it will be because God has a great plan for you and our nation. Putting his cheeseburger down, Donald Trump says, Robert, do you really believe that? To which he replies, yes, sir, I do. And after a moment or two, Donald Trump turns to Robert Jeffress, and he says this, okay, if that's true, then I have a question for you. Do you believe it was God's will for Obama to be president? To which the pastor replied, yes, sir, I do. And then he quoted in a Wendy's cheeseburger restaurant to Donald Trump several months before his election, Daniel 2.21, it is God who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and established kings. Was it God's will that Obama be president? Yes, sir. Was it God's will that Trump be president? Yes, sir. Is it God's will that Biden could be president? Yes, sir. There's a throne, and the powers that be are ordained of God. And God doesn't need to consult us on why and wherefore concerning what He's doing. Not only is He a sovereign God, He's a separate God. This comes out as we are introduced to the worship that's going on around the throne. We've got these angelic beings called seraphims that are serving God, and they're singing to God. There's this antiphonal worship going on. Verse 3, they're crying to one another. Notice what they're crying. Notice what they're singing. Notice what they're chanting. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. That's powerful. We just, I'm not sure we can grasp the awesomeness of this, the magnitude of this. Isaiah is introduced to the one he describes many times in his prophecy as the Holy One of Israel. The word holy here in the Hebrew it carries the idea of separate. You could even translate it other or even unique. That's interesting. Holy, holy, holy. Um, Other, other, other. Unique, unique, unique. That's what's being sung in heaven. I like unique, unique, unique. There's only one God, the Holy One of Israel. Why three times? That's a Hebraic way of emphasizing something. So so the, the inference of this is, At His essence, God is holy. It's interesting, God is love, but nowhere in the Bible do we read anywhere love, love, love. But you read holy, holy, holy. This is the massive fact about God. He's holy. He's distinct from His creation. He's in in, in some ways at a distance from His creation. God is not like us. You know, there's not a category you can think of in this world and multiply it by a million and, and, and think that may measure to what God's like. God's, God can't fit in any category. Other, other, other. Unique, unique, unique. Distinct, distinct, distinct. God's not like us. In many ways, He's unapproachable, incomparable. 
And then you add in to our creatureliness, our sinfulness. Not only are, are we different from Him in an infinite way, because He's infinitely different from us, but because of our sin, we are now at an infinite distance from Him, Isaiah 59 verses 1 to 2. Our sin has separated us from God. You understand this morning, if you don't, if you don't have your faith in Jesus Christ, the mediator between God and man, you're at a distance from God. Your sin has separated you from God. God's not your buddy. God's not your friend. God's not your father. But God has sent a son to die in your place to cover your sin, to die the just for the unjust, that he might become your father through his son. Talk to us about it. But here's the point. Holiness is a massive, unmistakable fact about God. It speaks about the uniqueness and otherness of His nature, the transcendence of His position and power, and the moral purity of His person and work. I'm thankful that God has come near to us in Christ, but the, but the imminence of God should not and does not cancel out the transcendence of God. In fact, it brings the marvel and the glory of His imminence into focus. This God who is other and transcendent and morally pure comes to us and bears our sin in Jesus Christ. Listen, holiness must shape our theology. His love and grace must be understood and valued and treasured in the light of His utter holiness. You will never appreciate His love until you've appreciated His holiness. He can justly send us to hell. His wrath can fall upon us. He's holy and we're sinful, and yet He loves us and graces us and favors us. What a marvel. We have got to bring holiness into our theology. It will put a sparkle to everything else. Holiness must grind and animate our evangelism. No point telling people to get saved and flee from the wrath to come if they don't understand the holiness of God, the transcendence of God. Holiness must define our worship. I mean, the, the seraphim veil their eyes. They've got two wings, according to verse 2, and with it they cover their face. They, they can hardly look at God in all His glory and the magnificence of His majesty. There, there's, there's a heaviness about this passage. There's a weightiness about this passage. Everybody involved in this passage gets a sense of, of who, of, of in whose presence they are. The seraphims cover their face, and we'll see this in a moment. Isaiah says, I'm busted. Woe is me. I don't belong here. The longer I stay here, I'm in e e eternal danger. We've lost that, haven't we? Come on, we've lost that. It's not your typical experience on a Sunday morning at your average evangelical church. No, no, we have lost the weightiness of God. In fact, He's holy, 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 and the whole earth is full of His glory. The word glory there is a Hebrew term, kavod, which means weighty. God is weighty. You treat Him lightly, but God is weighty. You treat Him as, as if He's nothing, and He's everything. And that's what we need to remind ourselves of. Isaiah was reminded of this. Listen to David Wells. It is one of the distinguishing marks of our time that God is now weightless. I do not mean by this that He, he is ether, uh, ethereal, uh, but, rather the, but rather has become unimportant. He rests upon the world so inconsequentially as not to be noticeable. That's why some of us slouch in our seats on a Sunday morning can't open our Bibles and give a yawn. God's inconsequential. I'm not bothered by Him. He doesn't frighten me. That's what we're being reminded of here. Those who assure the upholsters of their belief in God's existence may nonetheless consider Him less interesting than television, His commands less authoritative than their appetites for influence and affluence, His judgments no more awe-inspiring than the evening news. Can we, myself included, we, can we work harder at thinking more deeply about God? 
He's holy, holy, holy. C can we stop rushing into his presence with a shopping list and then retreating? Can we not spend time in his presence worshiping? Measuring the dimension of, 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 of his heavens and his universe and the, the glory and weight of his person? Can, can, can we regain the wonder, love, and praise that ought to mark those saved by grace? Can, can we not sense our sin more and glory in the one who bore our sin on the cross? C can we stop putting our arms around our spices as if Sunday morning is like a Friday night on a park bench? It's, it's holy, holy, holy. Other, other, other. Do, do you have any idea of whose presence you stand in? Tremble. That's what we see here. This is a small example of, of, of what I'm talking about, but I, I remember distinctly a Friday night in Belfast at a sports event when I said, where is the holy hush in the church? And I'll give you an example. It's such a, a poor example, but it, it, it puts us in a, in a certain direction. I'd, I'd, I was home, and I'd gone on a Friday night to a rugby game with my father and my brother. And um, uh, it was your typical rugby crowd, pretty raucous and rambunctious, to say the least. That's being kind. And, and um, you know, they were cheering, and, every, and when there was a try scored, the place would erupt. And a bit like American football, once the try or the touchdown had been scored, the kicker would come on, and it was a two-point conversion, pretty much the same idea, uh, where they would kick it through uh, the uprights. Um, uh, and and I, always, I remembered that night, it was a kind of blustery night, it was noisy and, and rambunctious, as I said, and, and every time the kicker put the ball down and stepped back, it, it was as if someone took a volume dial and just turned it down to zero. And this crowd that was animated and noisy and rambunctious, all of a sudden, complete silence. I, I'm telling you, that was the thought came to me, man, this is like a holy hush. You could just hear the wind whistling a little in the stadium. Not a voice, not a sound for a guy kicking a ball through two uprights. And, and, and you know, for them... Rugby was important. For them, they were in a moment. We need this score. Let's all be quiet. You know, the importance of it, the weight of it. But in the scheme of things, in the scale of things, nothing. And, and you and I are invited into the presence of, of God, and, and there's no holy hush. There's no sense of the importance of, of what is going on. We could do with regaining that. Look, for the time that remains, um, let, let me uh, deal with one more point here and then kind of quickly go through the last two points. It, it, a sovereign, separate, and served God. Uh, I, 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 I love this. The throne of heaven is surrounded by a host of seraphim. We read about this in, in verses kind of two... Um, through four, they're, they're the, an order of angels around the throne. They're, they're, they're Hebrew is they're burning ones. Hard for us to describe something we have never seen or understand. But I want you to notice these heavenly beings uh, have six wings. With two, they cover their face. And with two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly. John MacArthur's Bible st uh, study Bible is helpful here. Uh, with two wings... Uh, our two, two wings, they cover their faces. That speaks of their humility before the holiness of God, that, that, that sense of, of where they are and before whom they are. Even covering their feet is acknowledging their lowliness. Uh, and, and then the two wings allows them to engage in divine service where they, they fly. In fact, when you get to verse 6, you'll see that one of the seraphim flew to me. That would be at God's command, having in his hand a live coal. Here's the thing that strikes me. Pretty simple, but it's challenging. I'm struck by the busyness of heaven. The throne room of God is a beehive of activity. These celestial beings 
stand at the ready to wing their way to wherever God sends them. We're given a window uh, into what's going on in heaven. There's, a, there's a, a, um, an order of angels who just hover around the, 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 the throne of God, almost like helicopters that are hovering, ready to be sent on a mission. In fact, you see this in Psalm 103, where we read, The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you His angels, who excel in strength, who do His word, heeding the voice of His word. These beings were committed to God's cause, having seen God's glory, which they, along with God, desire to manifest throughout the world. Here's the point. You and I need to be available for God, just like the seraphim. They're humble with wings over their eyes and they're, 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 you know, humble with wings over their feet, but they are ready to serve at any moment. Which would remind us our greatest ability is our availability. We've all got abilities, but you know what? You can have an ability and not be available. Our greatest ability is our availability, giving ourselves to God. In fact, it's an interesting that after watching this, after experiencing this, that Isaiah will come in verse 8 to say, here am I, send me. He has watched the, the seraphim be sent, and he's watched them obey God's Word, and he wants the same for himself. Your greatest ability is your availability. James Draper says this, so many of us want to know the will of God in order to consider it, but God will only reveal His Word to those who are willing to do it, like the seraphim. We need to present ourselves to God, right? Romans 12, 1 to 2, if we're to know His good and acceptable will. I love the story I came across this week of G. Campbell Morgan, great pastor in England, uh, actually followed I was followed by Martin Lloyd-Jones in, in uh, Westminster Chapel. And the story is that he wrote a letter to a, a kind of uh, ministry acquaintance inviting him to come and speak at a Sunday school anniversary in his church. And after a week or two, he had heard nothing. He's wondering if the letter was lost in the post. And so he wrote another letter saying, hey, I don't know if you got the first letter, but I want to invite you to come and speak. He then gets a reply, and in the reply, he's, he's told that ex, the guy did get the first letter, but had uh, spent uh, two weeks uh, asking the Lord whether he should accept the invitation or not. And as of yet, he has no answer. Martin, uh, uh, G. Campbell Morgan writes back uh, that he's canceling the invitation. And then he had the, 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 the chutzpah to, to put this rejoiner, quote, I don't want as our anniversary preacher, a man who lives so far away from the Lord that he has to wait two weeks to hear his voice. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Are you not available, brother? Well, you know, what are you waiting on? God has spoken. Hear his voice. Do his will. All right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the terror because we've kind of, to some degree, covered that. Uh, other than um, t to bring out something I think is encouraging, I I in response to the time and the throne, we see the terror. And it's the terror of, of Isaiah, where, where he says, Woe is me, for I'm undone. I I'm a man of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. Isaiah shrinks senses his vulnerability before the holiness of God. He knows he's undone, ruined. I like the word busted. He's been spiritually busted. This is a holy God, and I am a sinful man. You know? It, it, he knew he was a sinner, but, but with this manifest, profound experience, his sin becomes all the more real to him. It's a bit like when you, you know, when you've opened uh, your, your blinds in, in a dusty room for a while, it doesn't look too bad until you open the blinds and, and the, the, you know, the sun comes in and all of a sudden you stand there in horror. Oh, dear. This place needs a good sweep. 
And that's the point. Uh, here, here he stands in the presence of a holy God, and he's very much aware of, of his sin. He's very much aware of the, the difference between him and God and the distance between him and God. It's interesting he mentions lips. Why does he talk about unclean lips? Because remember, out of the heart the mouth speaks. If his lips are unclean, his heart's unclean. And if his heart's unclean, his lips will be unclean. And the fact that he talks about lips, I mean, he's a prophet. He's, this is, his mouth is the instrument by which he seeks to glorify God, and yet now he has concluded that, you know what, his best efforts are poor, weak, unworthy, and alloyed with sin. So his initial reaction to the vision, he's not encouraged by it. He's actually in despair because of it. Woe is me, busted, done. And, and, and something beautiful happens where the angel comes and ministers to him, um, touching his lips with a, a live coal from off the altar, from, from probably the, you know, the, the um, altar of incense, which is all part of, of the, the, the way in which the people approach God and made atonement. And, and this, really, the whole point of verse 6 and 7 is that, that God makes atonement for Isaiah, touches his lips and makes him clean. Having encountered the glory of God, he now experiences the grace of God. Having encountered the majesty of God, he now encounters the mercy of God. But not unlike John, by the way, I was thinking about the parallel. If you want to write down John, Revelation 1, 17 to 18, John encounters the, the Christ amidst the candlesticks, this, this blazing figure. And what do we read about John? And he fell down as a dead man. Just again, you know, his self-image shattered in the presence of God, his sense of his fallenness. He, he, he falls down as a dead man. But we read and Jesus comes and says, John, fear not. Ministers in mercy and tells him to write the book of Revelation. Here's my point in this. The grace of God fits Isaiah for ministry. Here's a little thought. Walter Kaiser gave me this. He says that the word undone or ruined in the Hebrew can mean silenced. This whole thing had brought a prophet, a mouthpiece for God, to a point of complete silence. I would infer from that possibly Isaiah sees his ministry as done. My days of speaking for God are over. I don't deserve, nor am I fitted or worthy to represent the one who is holy, holy, holy. But God ministers in grace, doesn't He? And Isaiah's own deliverance fits him to deliver God's message to a nation under judgment. And here's my point. It is from a place of having been graced that we must minister. I want to say that again. It's from a place where God strips you down, breaks you, humbles you, then graces you, forgives you, and mercies you. It's from that place that we minister as a fact of servants of God. It is only those who have been humbled by their sin that are best placed to exalt the Savior of sinners. And that's what happens to Isaiah. God does send him and the silence is broken, and he ministers. Isn't that probably why George Whitfield was so effective? Because I'm not sure, having read several books on his life story, he got much beyond that moment that defined him, standing before the gallows, watching a man go to his death. As a Christian and as a minister of the gospel, he said to himself, what? There go I, but for the grace of God. Let's get to the task and be done. The task is just verse 8 and what follows. I can get this in in a couple of minutes. As we've said, he's, he's now encountered a sovereign God, a holy God whose glory fills the earth. He wants to be part of what is happening uh, in, in the spread of God's glory throughout the earth. He has watched the obedience of the seraphim, and now he wants to obey. And so, hearing God say, who can we send? Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Just as the holiness of God marks God's separateness 
Now Isaiah, having encountered that, separates himself onto God and the work of his kingdom. And here's the point, the assignment's tough. Read this later on because we're out of time, but verse 9 following, he is sent to a nation to preach the word, but the people won't listen. Judgment's coming. Um, the Babylonians will carry them off into captivity. There'll be a stump left, a remnant. That's a tough assignment. The issue wasn't his skill or his spirituality, it was the season. This was a nation in demise. And in verse 11, he asks, How long? Well, it's tough. Preaching without result. But it's tough taking all the barbs and the mockery. How long, God says, until the cities are desolated and the people have gone into exile? But I want to, I want to ask that question as we close and the team comes up. Where do you find the ability to go on when you're at that place? How long? I don't think I can do this much longer. Uh, we're, we're, well, if you look at this passage, I think it's a vision of God. It's the magnificence of God. It's, it's, it's getting a place where you understand the weightiness of God, and, 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 and it's about His glory, His kingdom. It's not about your comfort. It's not about what suits you or me. This isn't a ministry driven by guilt or pride. This is a driven by transcendence, privilege, and magnificence. As the team comes up, let me tell you this story. Um, J.D. Greer tells it in one of his books. It's a story about a grandfather and, a, and his grandson sitting on a porch lazily in the south somewhere. Around their feet are six dogs, you know, stretched out. And as this is going on, about a hundred yards away across the field, a rabbit darts out of the brush, takes a look at the house, and then darts back into the brush and the undergrowth. But one of the old dogs perks up. He got a sight of that rabbit, and, and he's off across the field. The other five, they waken up to what's going on, and they jump up, yapping and running across the field in hot pursuit of the first dog. Now, now the, the old man turns to this, the, little, the little boy, and he says, Son, I want to tell you what will happen. He says, In about ten minutes, the other five dogs are going to come back one by one. Heads hung low, tongues hanging out. And about 30 minutes later, the first dog will come back with the rabbit in his mouth. And that's exactly what happened. And when the young man observes this, he turned to his grandfather and he says, Father, how did you know that? To which the old man replied, because the first dog was the only dog that saw the rabbit. The others just got running and yapping out of excitement. And J.D. Greer says, you know, often that can be in the church. You get a bunch of people, hear a sermon, or part of some, some religious experience, and, and, and all of a sudden they go ra running off, yapping, making noise for, for, for Christ. But they come back pretty soon, all whipped. You know, heads low, tongues hanging out. No stamina, no perseverance, no effectiveness. Why? because they never got sight of the vision. They, they, they didn't see God high and lifted up. They didn't get swallowed up in His kingdom and His glory. And I, and I think in days like this, and perhaps, you know, we, we may be moving into challenging days where it could be increasingly challenging for churches like this that preach the full gospel. How are we going to sustain ourselves how are we not going to cave into the question, how long? It's a vision, like Isaiah 6, of a God high and lifted up, full of majesty and mercy, who commissions us to spread His grace and His glory throughout the earth. Father, we thank You for this word, timely, pertinent, certainly has been a blessing to me. Lord, we have attempted to shape history, and we thank you for the opportunity and providence to, to have a voice at the table of, of America's future. 
But we realize that's the foreground. The background is your throne, your kingdom, your glory, your sovereign rule. And in that we rest and help us to catch a glimpse of your greatness. We pray that it would, 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 would make us hungry to seek to glorify you throughout the earth. We, we thank you, Lord, given, given the distinction, given the distance, we, we glory in the fact that you do use us, that you clean our unclean lips, and you, you heal our brokenness, and you use us to bring your message. And so, Lord, um, may we retain this vision ever before us, lest we become exhausted and exasperated. For Jesus' sake, amen. If you need to relieve our children's ministry, we would encourage you to do that. Uh, other than that, we're going to stand and sing a stanza or two of our closing song, and then you are dismissed if you're a visitor. Uh, remember, at the back of the large tent, there is a welcome table and there's ministry tables. You can go and look into our ministry. Thank you for being here.